I'm Kathy Packer. I'm a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I'm the faculty director of the Center for Media Law and Policy. Before I introduce our speaker, I need to thank just a couple people. If I stop to thank everybody who contributed to today's events, we'd be here um, half the night at least. Um, I want to thank the, uh, first I'll thank the staff people who are here and um, work all day and then they're still here at night so that when the microphone goes dead, you know, or we don't know how to turn on the lights. Uh, so Morgan and Dylan, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate that. Uh, Woody Hartzog's been around all day putting out fires and following me around. It's here for Woody. Like, like nobody clapped for me, but you're all about Woody. I don't know. <laughs> don't say why. That's it. that's a good. Be quiet. Uh, but thank you um, for everybody who helped. My colleagues, Michael Hotchis is here, and um, for everybody's support. We received funding for today's events from the Liberty Tree Initiative, a national program that's funded by the McCormick Foundation. The Liberty Tree Initiative is an informal coalition of educators, journalists, librarians, artists, and authors with a shared interest in building awareness of the First Amendment through education and information. I also want to thank, in addition to the, our funders, the Daily Tar Heel, which this year very generously gave us free ad space for three days, um, and that enabled us to balance our budget. At least I hope it's balanced. I won't know till next week, but we'll hope it's balanced. But we really appreciate the support, uh, the great support of the Daily Tar Heel. Um, if you um, Woody, stand, stand up, Woody, since everybody wants to clap for you, you know. Show them your shirt, okay, turn around, turn around. That's it, right? If you'd like one of these shirts, they'll be for sale afterwards. And Amy up here, who also is wearing one of these shirts, I really should have let you model it, because you look better than Woody. Um, you know, you can get one from Amy right up here afterwards. Um, and then you can be cool. I had one on today, but then, you know, I had to like do my podium thing. Now, seriously, on behalf of the UNC Center for Media Law and Policy, I'm happy to welcome Frank Lomonti to Carolina. Mr. Lomonti is the Executive Director of the Student Press Law Center. The center has offices in Arlington, Virginia, and is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment and other legal rights of high school and college students. The Student Press Law Center advocates freedom for the student press, freedom of online speech, and open government on campus. It provides information, training, and legal assistance at no charge to student journalists and the educators who work with them. It's interesting that on its website, the Student Press Law Center quotes Kevin Swartz, Director and General Manager of our own Daily Tar Heel, and undoubtedly a reliable source. According to the website, Kevin says, quote, for 35 years, the SPLC has been the only national advocate for the free press rights of collegiate journalists. Had there been no SLP, SPLC, there is no doubt some publications would not have survived, end of quote. Mr. Lomonti joined the SPLC after working as a commercial litigation attorney in Atlanta and clerking for federal judge in the Northern District of Georgia and on the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Before law school, Mr. Lomonti was an award-winning investigative journalist and political columnist in state capitol bureaus in Florida, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. with the Morris newspaper chain. Mr. Lomonti graduated from the University of Georgia School of Law, where he was a senior editor of the Georgia Law Review. The title of Mr. Lomonti's address is New Media, Old Obstacles, How Online Publishing Is and Isn't Changing the Game for Collegiate Journalists. Mr. Lomonti, welcome to First Amendment Day at Carolina. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm kind of an aerobic speaker, so I'm going to be doing a little walking today. <laughs> That's enough of my huge face up there. That's quite enough uh, of what I want to say about that. Kathy, thank you. Thanks to the College of Journalism and Communications and Kathy and everybody who helped put this together and who 
kept the SPLC in their thoughts. I do want to say, though, that for a holiday, this is really kind of lame that everybody has to stay later than they would on a normal day. What kind of holiday is that? We need to work on that next year. This needs to be an official day off, maybe. Um, the, um, it's really exciting to see a college campus that is jazzed about the First Amendment and to hear, as Kathy described with the t-shirts, the words First Amendment and cool actually used in the same sentence. Not, not often enough, not nearly often enough. Um, so thanks to you guys for coming out um, and, and, and for the college for, for having me. And, and a special thanks to the people up the road at uh, Western Carolina University for writing my speech for me tonight. Um, those of you who have not seen your, uh, uh, your newspaper today, please go pick one up. Uh, uh, there's a, a really, really um, timely First Amendment controversy going on just up the road um, at Western Carolina where a uh, college newspaper was uh, shut down and put out of business for several days uh, under orders from the uh, university administration, something that we normally associate with um, poor quality high schools. Um, and uh, uh, yet in this day and age, in uh, 2010, uh, we had to administer a little uh, remedial uh, First Amendment slap upside the head to the people um, at Western Carolina that uh, you just don't go around doing that. Um, the. Um, <laughs> I do want to talk about um, online publishing and about some of the legal changes and changes in the in the media landscape that are going on. Um, I want to start, and, and, and you know, it's such a good place to be doing this at Chapel Hill because you guys really are one of the epicenters of innovation in, in media. You're really um, doing some some exciting stuff. Some of which we're going to we're going to show in a, in a minute and talk about. Um, I came, Kathy mentioned to you, I came to the SPLC, I'm still pretty new at this, came in 2008, and I remember last, last year we were sitting around and, and doing some, some brainstorming about the organization and about trying to um, kind of work on our, our name recognition, work on our, our, our brand, our, our mes messaging. And um, one of the things that, as we were having our old brainstorming session, that kept coming up and coming up and coming up was, well, people should support the Student Press Law Center because it's about the future of journalism. It's about the future of journalism. And I was just kind of sitting at the end of the table listening and taking this all in, and I said, you know, the heck with that. The heck with telling people that supporting the Student Press Law Center is supporting the, the future of journalism. We're supporting the present of journalism. And we don't know what the future is going to bring, but students are not the future of journalism. They're the, they're the present of journalism. You guys, people like you in this room, are doing some of the best journalism. And notice I don't say best student journalism. No asterisk on here. Some of the best journalism of any kind in America is coming out of college campuses like this one. When I picked up my Washington Post this week, Here's what I saw back home in Washington, right? A project created by people on campuses like this one, by the News 21 project. News 21 has a hub here at the College of Journalism and Communications and at other journalism schools around the country. Collaboratively, they came up with a sensational package of investigative stories that would be the envy of any professional journalist looking at how National Transportation Safety Board safety recommendations have gone ignored and delayed so that buses and trains and boats are less safe than they should be because government agencies have foot dragged on their compliance with known safety recommendations and known safety hazards. That's a story that needed to be told, and it only got told because journalism students rolled up their sleeves and told it. Okay? We see stories on a smaller scale all the time like this that don't go quite so, um, so well appreciated. Stories like Marcy Bursteiner at Humboldt State College, who teaches a class in investigative reporting. Her students investigated a suicide at the local jail. And what they were able to find, document, and expose was a badly broken mental health system that offered essentially no treatment at all, even to known suicidal inmates. A story done as a laboratory project by college students in a journalism program. 
students at Tarleton State University in Texas got curious because they noticed that year after year after year, their college's Clery Act crime reports, the crime reports that every college has to file with the US Department of Education and make public, year after year after year, those reports would show zero sexual assaults on campus. Their journalism instincts kicked in. They knew this wasn't right, and they proved it. They were able to demonstrate that during the time that their college reported zero, 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 five years in a row, that in fact 10 sexual assaults had been reported to the campus police, never got told to the US Department of Education, never showed up on public disclosure reports. As a result of these college journalism students reporting, their school was fined $130,000 by the US Department of Education, the largest fine in its history. Okay? So journalism students aren't the future of journalism. You are the present. You're doing great journalism now. And all it takes, all it takes is some curiosity and some know-how, and the technology is already here, right? The technology, there's never been lower barriers to entry to getting into the publishing business. If you don't tell these stories, if you don't tell these stories, we can't count on the professional news media to do it anymore because I don't know how many of you have been reading newspapers. Remember newspapers? <laughs> but the news media business isn't what it used to be. We are seeing news staffs and budgets and news holes slash because of the economy. And I don't think they're coming back. I don't think they'll ever be back to what they were. The Brookings Institution, the Brookings Institution, um, which is a, a a nonpartisan think tank in, in Washington did a, a study recently, came out with a study looking at how the mainstream news media covers education and school news. How much coverage of education and school news is getting into newspapers and newscasts and news websites. Education is the biggest part of every state's budget. It's the biggest thing that states spend money on. What percent? Just call out a number, what percent of news hole, what percent of news space, what percent of news time do you think is going to education coverage? Yell out a number. 15. 15? Five? Anybody got another one? 16. 15, 16, okay. Okay. Try 1.4. 1.4%. Which means 98.6% is not, 98.6% is not going to the most urgent public policy issue and the biggest area of state government spending. Now Brookings did not tell us how much was going to Snooki News, but I'm guessing it's more than 1.4%. <laughs> Maybe that'll be next year's study. <laughs> if you don't tell us what is going on on our campuses, we cannot count on the professional news media to do it anymore. The budget's not there, the staff's not there. Sometimes, frankly, the interest and the will is not there. That's a lot of responsibility, but luckily, luckily, you have tools and allies on your side, and I definitely want to spend some time talking about that. Um, you have got such a great situation here at the Daily Tar Heel and here at the University of North Carolina. You should really, really appreciate what you have because I am here to tell you in college journalism, it's a tale of two cities out there. It's best of times, worst of times. I mean, you can look at a paper like the Daily Tar Heel and the wonderful news coverage that you're getting and the wonderful editorial independence that they enjoy, but that's not the story at every college around the country. We're watching at the Student Press Law Center right now. I have to tell you, we're very, very fearful that the economy is gonna give colleges that never liked journalism and never liked their newspapers in the first place an excuse to abolish and slash those programs. We see it happening, we hear it happening. We've all got to be extra vigilant in this time that the economy doesn't become a smokescreen for censorship. The, um, the ability to publish online, the ability to publish online is, is opening up some amazing opportunities. You know, if you think about the kinds of things that people could do. I was in newspapers for a long time before I went to law school, but I didn't have the benefit of all the technology that you have today. 
you can tell stories in new ways. You can have reader interactivity. You can give people access to huge amounts of data. Think about the databases that you can find online that you could never have fit into a print publication before, right? But with that technology, there are risks and cautions that you need to observe. Um, as a, uh, as a lawyer, every, every year you've got to go to some seminars and get some training in um, continuing education. You've got to go get your, uh, get your credits every year. A couple years ago, I was back where I'm from in uh, Atlanta going to one of these seminars. And it was a seminar about media law. And a um, panel of people talking about um, social media. And this was the year that Twitter just blew up. This was the year that Twitter exploded on the scene and everyone was talking about it and everyone had to start doing it. And uh, one of the uh, social media experts on this panel was talking about how she uses Twitter as a sort of a microblogging platform. And, and the story that she told was, um, yeah, I, uh, I blog about uh, celebrity news. And um, I sent out uh, some tweets the other day where I was blogging about uh, which major uh, movie stars in Hollywood are, are secretly gay. Um, this is what passes for news. Um, I was blogging about which, which major movie stars are, are, are gay, and, and I messed up. I got one wrong. I, I, I named some guy that, that, that I shouldn't have. But it was OK, because my Twitter followers called me on it, and they corrected me on it. And so um, isn't it great that thanks to this technology, we're all collaboratively able to arrive at the truth together through crowdsourcing? Isn't that wonderful? And of course, all of us who practice um, libel law in the audience had to grip our chairs with both hands to not leap out of them because um, the truth is not an experiment, right? I mean, the truth is not something that you publish first and think about later. It's not ready, fire, aim, right? And you cannot let, you cannot let the casualness of publishing, you cannot let the casualness of publishing make you casual about the truth. You can publish more easily, but you can screw up more easily, too. The truth is technology neutral. The truth is platform neutral. And the truth is never obsolete. I want to talk a little bit about some of the changes in technology and how the law is adapting, or maybe not so much adapting, to them and some of the new legal problems and issues that people like me are starting to confront because of the new media landscape. Um, there's three areas that I want to focus on, and the first one is, and this is just, just a huge, huge issue that courts and legislatures and Congress are struggling with all the time. Who's a journalist, right? When everybody is publishing, when everybody can broadcast news to a mass audience, who's a journalist? Who gets to wear that name tag? Who gets to wear that credential? Who gets to put on that hat? And here's a reason that it matters. There's a bill pending in Congress right now. And those of you who are interested one day in going into journalism should really get yourself informed about this, because one day, this might be the only thing that stands between you and a federal prison cell. And it's called the Free Flow of Information Act. And the Free Flow of Information Act is better known as the reporter's privilege or the reporter shield, OK? And every state but one has recognized a reporter privilege or a reporter shield so that a journalist who has confidential sources or confidential news gathering information can keep those confidences despite being told to disclose them in a criminal or a civil legal proceeding. And these vary a little bit by structure, and they vary a little bit by what they cover. But every state by one, but one has recognized this, and yet Congress can't get its act together to pass it. And one reason, one reason, a major reason, why that bill has been stuck in Congress as long as it has is because of this question, who's a journalist? Who is going to get to claim the protection of the reporter privilege? 
and I, I hate to tell you this, students, but your fate is really not in your own hands. You are joined at the hip with people who are doing blog journalism, and I'm not going to uh, use the, uh, the P word, the, the pajama word. There are people on Capitol Hill who will, I will not. But there are, there, you are joined at the hip with unpaid uh, bloggers, who some in Congress do not want to see protected by the reporter's privilege. And the problem is that an unpaid student journalist, in the eyes of the law, looks a lot like an unpaid blogger, okay? So if that shield covers bloggers, it's gonna cover you. If it doesn't cover bloggers, it's gonna leave a lot of you out in the cold, okay? And here's why it matters. Some of you heard about a story, got a lot of publicity back at the end of last year, and it's still going on now in Chicago. There is a terrific project that journalism students at Northwestern University's Medill School work on called the Innocence Project. And there are Innocence Projects at other colleges around the country, but this is one of the biggest and oldest and most established of them at Medill University. And these students have the awesome responsibility of reopening closed cases, going back and reinvesting investigating criminal cases where some doubt has been raised about whether the person in prison was really guilty or not. And sometimes they find nothing and they just close the file. Sometimes they find cause for doubt. Sometimes they find reasons to reopen cases and they have gotten people out of prison who were wrongfully convicted, okay? That is journalism that matters. That's journalism with impact. There are students right now at Medill University, at, at, at the Medill School at Northwestern University whose confidential news gathering materials are being fought over in the courts as the subject of a subpoena. These students found cause to doubt the conviction of a man named Anthony McKinney who was in prison serving a life sentence for murder. They published their findings, they turned over their findings to the Northwestern University Legal Clinic, and the prosecution responded by going head on after those students and trying to get all their notes, their tapes, their recordings, their memos, their grades, their class materials, everything underlying the journalist's investigation. Now, I can't guarantee this. I can't say this for sure. But if these journalists weren't in school, if these weren't college student journalists, I don't think we'd be having this fight. Because I think prosecutors know they can't push around professional journalists. They know they can't try to force professional journalists to disclose their confidences. But we haven't gotten there yet with students. Students too often still are treated as second class even when they're doing first class journalism. That's got to change and we've got to fix it. It's wrong in this day and age that your entitlement to the reporter's privilege depends on who signs your paycheck. That's true in too many places, including our friends down in Texas who just passed an incomplete reporter shield last year, which only covers people who make a substantial salary off of journalism and not people like you and not people like the Medill students and not people like those News 21 students doing that outstanding professional caliber work. Okay. I don't know the answer to who's a journalist. I'm not gonna pretend that I know. There's a bill pending in the Senate, a version of the Free Flow of Information Act that seems to have it figured out pretty good. And it's based on your intent to gather and present news to the public. That seems like a pretty good test, right? The roll out of bed test. When you rolled out of bed and you picked up that flip camera off the dresser, were you doing it because you intended to go out and gather news to share with the public? And it doesn't matter who signs your paycheck, and it doesn't matter if you're enrolled in school. That's a pretty good definition. There are ways that that could be tinkered with, there are ways that could be tweaked. I'm not here to, here to argue about that, but we need to come to a resolution and figure that out. We need to draw a line somewhere, and it's tough. It's really tough. I'm not gonna tell you it's not. There are gonna be some people who think they're journalists, who are doing things that look journalistic, who are gonna be left out in the cold. 
That's the reality of the line drawing exercise. But that bill, that bill needs to get passed. And you all can help by writing editorials, by getting informed about it. Um, the other way, the other way that changes in the industry have impacted on the practice of journalism and on the law governing it is that they've upped the ante on privacy. They have upped the ante on privacy. There's not a week that goes by that our hotline at the SPLC doesn't get a call that goes just like this, okay? Here's the call. I'm the editor of a college newspaper. There's an angry person on the phone who got caught smoking pot when they were 19 years old. They're now 29 and they say they can't get a job because the very first thing that comes up in their Google search results is the 10 year old pot bust and they're demanding that we take this down, right? That's a pure web 2.0 journalism issue, right? This was never ever an issue before online archiving and before search engines got this good. Think about it, right? No one ever, ever came to my college newspaper and said, you gotta get a razor blade and go to the library stacks and cut my crime story out of the paper, right? No one cared. It was the term, the term of art and in information science is practically obscure. It was practically obscure. It was find but nobody would. It was findable, but nobody would. Now, these, these minor 10-year-old peccadilloes are suddenly findable. And I will tell you, you know, there are some really heart-wrenching individual cases that you hear. It's a really, really tough judgment for editors to make. Most editors that I know of come down on the side of a complete historical record. They don't want to get in the business of taking information off the record and erasing history. There are others that are struggling with this and coming to other resolutions. There are papers that are taking names out of crime stories. There are papers that are uh, not publicizing police blotter items at all until the crime is resolved. There's lots of judgment calls that people can make, and I'm not gonna tell you that there's one that's legally better than the other. That's a matter of ethics, it's a matter of professional judgment, but it's something that people are having to really wrestle with for the very first time. It's a first generation problem, and it's one that you guys in this room are gonna have to help figure out. Now, privacy law, again, those of you who read your Daily Tar Heel cover to cover this morning know that there are privacy law issues being fought out right here on this campus about entitlement to public records and public information. And that, too, is a result of what has been going on in the industry and in the field. We are seeing much, much more aggressive use of federal privacy laws to take educational information off the public record. We're seeing much more aggressive use of the federal FERPA privacy law to deny open records requests. And I don't have any proof of this, but I think it's because government agencies have figured out that newspapers and TV stations don't have the money they used to to assert their rights in court. Records of schools and colleges should be, with some narrow exceptions, open public records that you can get, that any citizen can get, by using a freedom of information request. Too often, waves and waves of these documents are being taken off the record with bogus claims of federal privacy. Let me tell you about a case we're working on right now up in the state of Maine, giving an example of what's at stake. There's a newspaper in Maine that got a tip about students in, a local, in the local public schools being excessively um, restrained by teachers. Teachers uh, with, with the right amount of training, with the right amount of training and certification are allowed to put kids into certain holds in order to immobilize them if they act out in dangerous ways. But not everybody is allowed to do this and not everybody, and, and not any old method is allowed. There are regulations on who can do it and how they can do it. This newspaper got a tip that it wasn't being done properly in their school system, that there were excessive uses of dangerous holds by people who were untrained to do it. In the old days, the Freedom of Information Act 
or the main equivalent of that, would have clearly entitled that newspaper to know who was putting students into chokeholds, how often, and what training they received. But that school district won't give up that information, and they're claiming it's because of student privacy, even though the newspaper has said they'll take the records with all of the students' identities blacked out and wiped out. So you can see, right, that agencies are aggressively using claims of student confidentiality to take newsworthy, important public safety information off the public record. They're getting more and more aggressive about it because they know that news organizations can't always push back. That's another way that student journalists can help fill that gap. I, 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 I was uh, in a uh, class here earlier today. Some of you were, were, were in there with me. And I asked at the uh, near the end of the class, how many people in this class have made a uh, open public records request? 45 people in the audience. No hands went up. And that made me sad. That made me sad. Uh, uh, I would like to come back here next year and see 45 hands go up. I don't think anybody should graduate with a degree in journalism without having at least tried out their state or federal open records act. It's a fundamental building block skill of being a journalist. Last one I want to talk about in terms of the new wave of publishing technology. Um, the good news, the good news is that readers can now comment on news stories. That's the good news. The bad news is that readers can now comment on news stories. Right? And, Many, many news organizations are wrestling with what the right amount of supervision is over reader comments. And I want to read you, I just, I'm sorry, I just love this. I don't like reading, reading a speech, but I have to read you this. this the, the editor of the uh, Southern Illinois uh, College newspaper, the, uh, the Daily Egyptian, uh, last year they made the internal editorial decision, the editors at the Daily Egyptian did, to, uh, to disable reader comments, to just disable reader comments. And, and here's, what the, uh, here's part of what the editor wrote in, in making that decision. She said, um, comment privileges for news stories are revoked until the daily objection has reason to believe our readers are mature enough to use them. <laughs> Congratulations. It is not easy to offend college students who spend most of their time in a newsroom, but some of you have persevered pursuing Standards of bad taste to depths so subterranean that we could not help but take note. <laughs> I just thought that was wonderful. I mean, she really took, a, took her readers to task. Uh, you could tell that was coming from the heart. And, and, and that debate is going on on a lot of college campuses because we have the collision of two values. You know, a college campus is supposed to be a place where the First Amendment is at its max, right? It's supposed to be a place of academic freedom, of the free exchange of ideas, and we all get that, we all understand that, we all respect that. On the other hand, right, a college campus is also supposed to be a place of civility. It's supposed to be a place of dignity and respect where people treat each other as peers, treat each other with a level of professionalism, right? And those two things can't always be neatly reconciled in the wild, wild west of reader comment boards. We dealt with a case in the last school year, some of you may have read about this, at Virginia Tech University. At Virginia Tech, the school, or, or uh, a, uh, a committee at the school, at a committee at Virginia Tech actually threatened at one point to pull the plug on funding for the student media unless the newspaper started exercising content policing over reader comments because, why? Because readers were populating those comment boards with racial insults and epithets. And you know, that's the hardest First Amendment argument you could possibly make, right? Is that there's a First Amendment right to engage in racial name calling. You know, how, how can anybody be in favor of that. But you know, the the people at at the Collegian at, at Virginia Tech wanted to make sure that their readers didn't didn't feel censored, that their readers had some breathing space to express controversial views, controversial views without crossing the line into libeling people, threatening violence, defamation, obscenity 
things that we all agree cross the line. And fortunately, fortunately, the students at Virginia Tech were able to back that threat down and were able to maintain their own autonomy. How? By coming up, coming up with good standards for the management of their comment board and enforcing them consistently and fairly. Right? That's an issue that all media are going to have to deal with, but it's uniquely, uniquely making itself felt on college campuses because of that collision of values. And again, I'm not here to tell you, here's what the law says, by the way. I give you some bonus law here. Here's what the law says, right? The law says if you are the operator of a news website, you're not legally liable for comments posted by unrelated third parties, somebody that wanders in off the street, right, and posts something on your site. If you didn't solicit that particular content, right, you didn't contribute to creating it, you did no more than provide the forum for the people to use to post their own comments, that speech is not yours for purposes of defamation law, for purposes of privacy law. And so while your editorial standards and good judgment may be telling you to pull it down, the law will not make you. The law will not make you. Now, the person who wrote the defamatory or the invasive comment can still be caught and sued if they are found, but you as the proprietor of that site cannot be. You're immunized under federal law called the Communications Decency Act, okay? That's the law. But ethics and judgment and professionalism sometimes say, right, that you don't always publish all the speech the law lets you publish. And it's true with these reader comment boards. Again, I don't have an answer. This is not a one size fits all, but it's something that everybody needs to wrestle with and come to a resolution on. And it's something that those of you who work in the student media, start of every term, new editor, sit down, have that conversation, have that conversation, anticipate the problem, because it's going to come. It's going to happen. Um, I definitely want to leave a little time for questions at the end, so I do, I do want to wind down. Um, let me, um, we said that we would talk a little bit about what you can do, right? We said we would talk a little bit about what you can do to help protect your own rights. I want to show you, here's the very best thing you could do. Here's the very best thing you could do. You could color in North Carolina red. Sorry, I know that's not your color. I know that's NC State, but you could color in North Carolina red. Seven states, seven states have enacted state level protections for student speech at the college and the high school level. Excuse me, six at the college and the high school level, a seventh only at the college level, Illinois, right? have statutory protection at the state level that goes beyond the protection recognized by the Supreme Court under the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment. In these states, students have the benefit not of every single right that people have at the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and in the professional news media, but they have the benefit of making their own editorial judgments unless their speech is illegal or unless it threatens to substantially disrupt the operations of the school. And that's a sensible balance that these states have reached. And I will tell you that in almost every case, in almost every case, the leadership to get laws like that enacted came from people like you and not people like me. In fact, frankly, people like me showing up is probably the worst idea because if there's anything that really makes a state legislator's day, it's a guy in a suit from Washington showing up to tell him what to do, right? That's really, really a happy conversation. They need to hear from you. They need to hear from the people who live in their state, who vote in their districts, and you all do vote, right? Who live in their state, who vote in their districts, who know the standards of their community. It's not impossible to do, okay? Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, not places we normally associate with radical First Amendment activity, okay, are on this list. They have better protections for student speech than you have today in North Carolina, and there's no good reason for that. You have some of the best college journalists in America, and they should have some of the best laws to match it. Okay? That's something that all of you can do to help protect your own rights. Um, let me mention two other things, because um, I, um, <laughs> we have, um, 
At the Student Press Law Center, um, we spent a lot of time telling people about their rights and on occasion even going to court to help them protect and assert their rights. But we never, ever want to leave an audience like this without talking a little bit about responsibilities, too. Because the fact of the matter is that you can do things that either make our job very easy or you can do things that make our job really hard, OK? I mentioned one already, and that is you got to use those rights, OK? You got to use them. There are people who are fighting really hard in the courts and the legislatures and the halls of Congress to make a better legal landscape for you. And if you don't use it, it's just rude. It's just rude. It's like showing up when somebody cooked a big meal and you don't even take a taste of it. You got to take a taste, OK? We're fighting to make sure that you have the best free speech rights and the best access to information rights possible. Do us a favor and go out and use them. Take a bite, take a taste, enjoy it. You're going to like it, OK? I really, really want to thank Kevin Schwartz and everybody at Daily Tar Heel because they are using freedom of information laws to really hold their own school's feet to the fire and, and, and to try to push back against some of the misuse of the FERPA privacy statute here at the University of North Carolina. That's something every college journalist can and should be doing. The second thing, the second thing is you've got to, got to, got to help us on the attack speech this hateful attack speech that is populating the internet. You've got to help us on that. Why? Because when I go into a court and I stand in front of a judge and I am trying to argue for why students should have expanded First Amendment rights and why they shouldn't be censored by their schools and their colleges, we cannot have judges and juries sitting there and thinking about cyberbullying and hate speech and attack speech. We cannot have that be the picture of student speech. We cannot have of judges thinking that that's what they're being asked to protect. This is what they're being asked to protect. This is what they're being asked to protect, the ability to freely do great journalism. But you have got to help us try to dial down the temperature of some of that hateful racial attack speech that is going on out there too often on comment boards and social networking sites, because that's the picture that policymakers and judges have too often when they're thinking about student speech. There's nothing that sets us back worse, nothing that sets us back worse than somebody cheaply using their First Amendment rights to take a cheap attack hit on somebody using hate speech. The, um, I started out by saying that the, the truth is, is never obsolete, even on Twitter, right? The truth is never obsolete, and neither is good taste. Neither is good taste, neither are good manners, and neither is good judgment. I'm going to stop there and see if anybody has any, any questions. Let's talk. I read about this, there is an ongoing controversy going on right now at the University of Colorado Boulder about why they are restructuring their journalism program in the way that they are. There are some who have offered a sort of a neutral reason to say, well, uh, we just want to keep pace with technology, want to keep pace with new developments. But in the process of doing that, they fired a very well-credentialed journalism advisor. And there was known, known years of hostility between the administration and between the university and the the student newspaper and we're real worried about that university we're watching them very very closely I'll tell you that it's definitely going on it's absolutely going on at the high school level we see that uh, all across the country that 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 student papers that were already sort of on the edge are being pushed over the edge in the name of financial necessity. Some of you may have read about this. The state of Kansas has actually decided that uh, they're no longer going to provide state funding for journalism uh, programs as a, uh, as, as, as a uh, vocational preparation activity because, in their view, it isn't a vocational preparation activity. In their view, there isn't any vocation to prepare for. And so they're withdrawing statewide funding for journalism, which brings with it the consequence of the loss of federal matching money. So that's a huge whack taken out of a state by 
by the way, that's been known for excellent, excellent journalism and is one of the seven states on that on the good map. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's enough out there to worry us and there's, there's plenty that we're watching. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. What's really good about both the Federal Shield proposals and also about uh, uh, most every state shield law is that they are media neutral. They don't speak to print. They don't speak to broadcast. They just speak to sort of the news gathering process. And that's the point of shield laws, right? The point of shield laws is to protect the integrity of that news gathering process, the relationship between journalist and source, the ability of a journalist to kind of formulate mental impressions and jot them down on paper without having to uh, uh, explain them later. The, 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 uh, all the shield laws that I'm aware of are, are, are media neutral, and they apply to anybody who is in that chain of the creation of the end product uh, of news that is to be shared with the public audience. So if you're a copy editor, you're a page designer, you're a photo editor, as long as you're doing something that prepares news for dissemination to the public, you're, you're shielded. Go ahead. Yeah, for those of you who couldn't hear that, I mean, that's a huge First Amendment issue is cyberbullying and, and the protection of students against uh, sort of online uh, attack speech in particular. Here's, you know. First of all, the answer is that uh, 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 the states have, have really charged out of the gate on this and have adopted, um, uh, their, I think the last count was 44 states have got either a statute or a regulation that aims at uh, uh, some form of uh, uncivil speech that is uh, used by students to victimize other students uh, using electronic means. And, and, and some of those, frankly, um, are, uh, they do no more than and take existing um, statutes about harassment and threats, and they add the internet to them. And constitutionally, I think those are not objectionable. Con constitutionally, the, if uh, uh, threats and harassment are already unprotected speech under the First Amendment, so just adding the new delivery method of the internet probably does nothing, uh, 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 no violence to the First Amendment. Where you have First Amendment issues raised, and there are states that have formulations that are more constitutionally suspect, are, are, are a couple things. First, there are some state laws that don't require any kind of a wrongful intent, okay? In other words, you can make a, a, a well-intentioned remark that is taken by somebody as hurtful, and that may be enough under some state laws to qualify as bullying. That doesn't seem like it could be constitutionally right, right? It doesn't seem like it could be constitutionally right that you just get unlucky and, and you have somebody misinterpret a remark and, and, and it uh, transforms you into a bully. Um, the, the other thing that, that the courts are really struggling with, are really struggling with, is the extent to which school jurisdiction can reach off-campus speech that has no nexus with the school, right? I mean, I think the easiest case, the easiest case is where a student does something to bring their bullying speech physically onto the campus, right? I have a website on an iPhone and I hold it up and I show it around to people on campus. I've brought that speech onto the campus. I don't think anybody has any problem at that point with the school saying we have jurisdiction over that speech. The tougher problem, the trickier problem, is where the speech has no connection to school. And there's a pair of cases right now, really interesting cases, pending in the federal appeals courts, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, that are going to tell us we're going to get some guidance from the federal courts very soon about how much schools can reach websites done by students on personal time using personal computers that don't ever physically enter the school based on the possible consequences within the school. Now, I will tell you, you know, we certainly, we certainly, as an organization, we're about protecting kids. We sure don't want to declare 
you know, that it's, that it's impossible to regulate cyberbullying. I, 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 we all know it's a problem. We all know there need to be remedies for it. But you got to be really careful about drawing that line in a way that makes sure that students are able to use the internet for legitimate editorial commentary about the school without being criminalized as bullies. I mean, it's a fascinating issue because you know the student on student bullying is one thing, and, and, and it's very hard to make a First Amendment defense for that. It's easier to make a First Amendment defense. Uh, 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 there are some statutes which even try to penalize student on administrator or student on employee bullying. Those are a little bit tougher, right? Because a student commenting on another student is never going to be really a matter of public concern, right? A student commenting on another student is never going to be something that there's a larger public interest in. But a student commenting on an administrator might be, right? It might be. And I think we all recognize there's a vast range of speech out there. You know, nobody would disagree, right? Nobody would disagree over here on the extreme that a statement on a student website like, I'm going to shoot the principal in the head, right? Unprotected speech. No doubt, no argument. Classic unprotected speech. On the other hand, a statement by a student on their website that says, the principal is doing a poor job and should be replaced, right? Classic protected speech. Speech on a matter of public concern about a high-ranking public official, that's got to be protected speech. Now the question becomes, what do you do about all that speech in the middle? What do you do about all that speech in the middle? If the principal is a bad principal is protected speech, how about over here? The principal is a bad person. How about over here? The principal is a jerk. How about over here? The principal is, as is the case pending in front of the New York Appeals Court right now, a douchebag. <laughs> That's what federal judges get paid to decide. <laughs> the answer, I think, right, and Justice Brennan, Justice Brennan, the greatest First Amendment authority ever to sit on the US Supreme Court, already answered this question for us. Justice Brennan answered that question in a case that predates the internet, the uh, case of NAACP versus Virginia. In that case, Justice Brennan used this term that's been used over and over again since then, that the First Amendment needs breathing space to survive. The First Amendment needs breathing space to survive. And what he means by that is that the person doing the speech has to get the close calls. The person doing the speech has to be able to step right up to that line and maybe an inch over it without getting busted. Because if, they're, if they can't, if they don't have the freedom to do that, then they're going to stop themselves short of the line. They're going to censor themselves, and a whole lot of speech that might be meritorious is never going to be heard and never going to be said. So the close call, the tie has to go to the runner, right? The close call has to go to the speaker. We see that in every other area of First Amendment law except for two, except for schools and federal prisons. Schools and prisons. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want schools to be in that category. I don't want to see schools over there. I want to see schools over here with the rest of the American non-felon citizenry. <laughs> Sorry, that answered your question in about six other ones. <laughs> Who's got one more? Well, guys, go out and Enjoy the First Amendment. Enjoy the rest of this day. Enjoy this beautiful campus and this wonderful journalism school. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you.